When it comes to writing a script for a movie or a television show, it usually starts with a formula. But even though we all know that professional wrestling is scripted, we hardly ever talk about writing wrestling with the exact same manner. Even though, just like those other things, a wrestling match does of course have a formula as well. A formula? That's the topic of this episode, because today... A major thank you to all of my awesome Patreon supporters such as Edgar Perez, Bob86, and Cool Ass Jack. Thank all of you so much. There are those out there who would say that writing guidelines are really pointless and unnecessary, but that doesn't change the fact that there are many great works out there that all began with a writing formula. Now, when it comes to composing a professional wrestling match, that too does have a basic structure, but it's by far less divisive, as there is one standard outline that tends to be the most common, and in my opinion, it's definitely a thing of beauty. Not only does it explain every match that you're ever going to see, but it also allows for many different styles, different wrestlers, and is also the reason why many in the industry feel that there's no such thing as a tweener. And further still, even though it is scripted, it does also allow for a lot of improv. Okay, so we have a lot to cover here, but before we do, allow me to ask that you make sure you take part in this channel's formula for success by being subscribed to this channel and making sure that you hit that like button. Okay, so now, with that being said, let's break it down. So the first part that we're going to talk about isn't an official part of the match, but I do think it's pretty important and it does deserve a mention, and that's the setup. Because before the match even starts, it's key to know certain things going into it. Who's going over, what exactly is the booker looking for, and what specific spots need to happen. Further still, there are other things we need to know too. Who's the heel, who's the face, not to mention other details like who's coming out first and where on the card the match is being placed, which is an important detail too, as it greatly determines a lot of what's going to happen, and talent should also be aware of the other spots in other matches, that way they don't accidentally steal something from another match or burn a crowd out on certain moves. Okay, so now that we've preheated this thing, let's go ahead and get this match started. The first and most crucial part of the match is where the wrestlers get their chance to shine, because this is where we start establishing the rules of engagement for the audience, and one of the biggest parts of this equation is letting the fans know who's the heel and who's the face. It's vital that one never assumes that the audience is following their programming. Remember, every match is potentially someone's first, or perhaps they are a Lats fan who might be giving you another go. Either way, while commentary, video packages, and even the entrances themselves can clue people in, it's best to also make sure that you can tell just from the opening in-ring sequences alone. And rumor has it that Vince McMahon himself watches audition tapes on mute just to see if it's clear who a wrestler is without any help from the crowd or commentary. If the body language speaks volumes without any sound, then of course the wrestler must be even better with it. Now, one of my own personal favorite examples of this happens to come from a match between Darby Allen and the Velveteen Dream. Yeah, that's right, I said the dream and Darby. Remember that whole Forbidden Door thing is just a bunch of nonsense? Anyway, here, the more well-known wrestler at the time, Velteen Dream, was going into the bout as the heel, but the fans kept cheering for him. So in order to establish the parameters, every time Darby attempted to start wrestling, Dream would slip out of the ring and start posing. He did this over and over again until eventually the fans got tired of it and started booing him. And as a result, they started cheering Darby in the process. And just by watching this, no audio recording Required, you can pick up right away who's the face and who's the heel. Another great example comes from the old days of Ring of Honor, when both men were required to shake hands. If one refused, immediately it became clear who the bad guy was. And don't think that you can only do these specific things, as they're just some great examples and there are plenty of other ways to shine. But let's not get too bogged down into that because we still have other things to go over while we're in the beginning stage of this match. Okay, so now that we've made it clear to the audience about who's good and who's bad, it's time to really kick this pig. 
In the beginning, this is where all combatants will try to get the advantage. Typically, and the easiest way to tell this tale, is that both wrestlers will just try hand-to-hand, -to -hand, toe -to toe wrestling. Only the heel will soon learn that while he might try, he just can't out-wrestle the babyface. Now, this doesn't just have to be about who can out-wrestle the other one. Take for instance, how about a hoss fight, where it's two wrestlers trying to outstrong the other one. Or maybe this match is about finding out who's really more hardcore. Whatever the case might be, remember, we're establishing the rules of engagement here. And the point is, whichever wrestler decides to break from this pattern first, that's the one that's going to be the heel as far as this formula is concerned. And this is why there are some people out there who feel like there are no such things as tweeners. Because no matter what the kayfabe story is, in the end, when it comes to this formula, someone has to fill both of these roles. Even if both wrestlers in kayfabe are represented as babyfaces, someone has to fill the heel role in the formula of the match. And even in triple threats, tag teams, and other multi-man matches, these two positions do still get filled even if it's not equally. Anyway, once the heel realizes that he can't play the faces game, well, he's gonna have to resort to... Well, that leads us to... This is where the heel can really get some heat on him. As soon as he figures out that he can't match skill with the face, well, that's when he can start trying some other tactics. Namely, starting to bend and manipulate the rules a little bit. Hey, if you can't outwork him, then outsmart him. Now, most of the time, the heel will cheat here. A low blow or a thumb to the eye when the ref's not looking levels the playing field real quick and instantly cuts the baby face off from any advantage and brings them down to size. But it doesn't necessarily have to be something that's as blatant as a chair shot to the back, as sometimes it's just a bit of questionable behavior. Things like not releasing a hold until the very last possible second while the baby face is on the ropes, or kicking your opponent in the stomach while you're locked into a test of strength, or running out of the ring to avoid the baby face only to to turn around and attack him as soon as he comes chasing after you are not technically illegal, but they're not exactly kosher either. Whatever the tactic is, the heel has to get the advantage here, but it can't be done by simply grappling. This even happens in matches booked as babyface versus babyface, as one wrestler could tweak his knee or something while his opponent would capitalize on that injury. While this act in and of itself wouldn't count as a heel turn to anybody, as far as the formula of this match is concerned, it does make him the heel. The point is, the heat is when the lesser comes Ban gains the advantage, whether it's by cheating, outsmarting, or just bending the limits of what's considered not cool. Either way, it all counts as the heat. Of course, the heat leads to the babyface's comeback, because this is the moment where the babyface gets the advantage yet again. When it comes to professional wrestling, it's all about the back and forth struggle, about who has momentum and when. It's almost like that's what grappling is all about. And it's this very shift in momentum that's the key to this entire procedure. And again, this can be done in a variety of ways. The heel can get cocky and get distracted, allowing for the babyface to recover. Or perhaps he gets frustrated after a long two count doesn't get the job job done. Either way, this momentary lapse in judgment does give the face an opportunity to out-wrestle the heel and take control back of the match by scoring a big reversal. And what's really cool here is that cheating isn't necessarily off the table. While a bad guy has to take liberties in order to gain advantage, a baby face doesn't necessarily have to stay clean this entire time in order to get his comeback. For instance, if a heel's been dastardly enough and has been getting away with blatantly cheating throughout the match, eventually the baby face will get carte blanche to give the heel a taste of their own medicine. Medicine, as seeing the bad guy get his comeuppance is a satisfying sight for the audience, especially when it's well deserved. Plus, what's cool is that this doesn't have to happen just once, as these two stages can repeat over and over again. As we can also sometimes get a false comeback, where the heel cuts off the baby face from regaining momentum, and thus the process begins anew. A match can have as many heats and as many comebacks as the wrestlers choose, but by that token, don't think that any time that a wrestler just lands one single punch in the middle of getting worked over for five minutes straight means that that's a comeback. Instead, try to look at these as stages and try to look at the bigger picture of the story being told of this match. Take notes to pivotal moments where the entire tone of the match completely changes direction. This is when we move to one phase to another, until eventually it all comes down to... This is what it's all about. 
As mentioned earlier, the finish is usually known to the wrestlers before the match even begins, although sometimes things can change on the fly. But how much of the finish is predetermined by booking can vary, as sometimes it could be as simple as just telling the wrestlers who's going to win, while other times it can be a really elaborate sequence, and of course, everything in between. Now, this does also go for everything that we've already talked about so far, as the amount of planned spots and instructions that the wrestlers receive does vary, with some matches being heavily scripted down to the T, and others being greatly determined by those who are working in the ring at that specific moment. At any case, this is where we find out who wins and who doesn't. Regardless of who is heel or face, or who has momentum, we get a winner here, or a no contest, or whatever. What it all boils down to is here is where we get the resolution to the story we've been told throughout the entire bout. Was the babyface's comeback successful, or was it all for naught because the heel would come out on top in the end? Whatever the finish is, it all happens as a result of writing the wrestling formula. Alright, so now you know the wrestling formula. See if you can spot these phase changes in the next match that you watch. And please make sure that you're subscribed to this channel and that you give this video a big like. And also, thank you to all my awesome Patreon supporters out there and to you for watching. And as always, Dave knows.